Hello and welcome to another edition of uh, Calling Home, where we speak to a person who is away from the Northeast. Somebody who's done well, somebody who's exceptional, and someone who's made a name. Uh, someone who can guide us, be an inspiration for the youth across in the Northeast. And today, we are joined by Usha Bora. She's CEO and founder of uh, Family. Usha, uh, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Thank you. Uh, she owns a home and lifestyle design brand that combines Indian craftsmanship with a dash of Parisian sheep. So she's in Paris right now. Uh, she was born and raised in Assam. She has BA in economics from Lady Sri Ram College in Delhi. Uh, from there, she went on to do her MBA from IIM Ahmedabad. And another MBA, and just a while ago, we were joking about this. It's a double MBA uh, or in luxury brand management from SF Business School. So fantastic. Uh, Usha, you got a double MBA. We were joking about this a little while earlier. Yeah. My first question was going to be on your journey from Assam to Delhi to Paris. But I think if we are to cover this topic, we would take about a few hours, I guess. I guess, yeah. So, so let's start with your childhood. Uh, how did uh, you know your childhood in Assam uh, shape you and what you are today? Well, it had everything to do with um, how I turned out. <laughs> so basically, I was born in a place called Margarita, which is beyond Big Boy. My father worked for the coal mines. So I spent all my life between Margarita and the Brugger and uh, sometimes coming to Guwahati because my grandparents lived there. So it was just, you know, it was an idyllic life, growing up amongst the tea gardens, going to school, uh, having lots of friends, hanging out over the weekends. It was really, really nice. And I was very lucky to have my granddad, who used to be the chief conservator of forests. So I spent a lot of time with him in the forest. Uh, every holiday, my, mo my mother would sort of pack me off to my grandparents because she had my sister and then she couldn't manage all the kids at that time because she was working. So I spent a lot of time with my granddad and I think that had a huge impact on my uh, personality and my vision in life and my connection with Assam actually. So um, everything I've done since then has been in a way connected to, uh, to India and to Assam in particular. It continues to be the case even today. Yeah, so it's big impact. Wow. Uh, Margarita, uh, the forests around, uh, I think yeah. Green Patkai, uh, where there's a little controversy right now. Right. Uh, this, 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 this area is so beautiful, so vibrant, so lush. Uh, you know, there's culture, there's seeped in culture. Uh, and again, to what you do to, today, you know, uh, you have a home and lifestyle design brand. How right. many times have you designed something and, uh, you know, uh, while imagining uh, what is to come out, gone back to the forest? of Margarita or the tea garden to look all at the, the colors time. there. All the time. It's not necessarily the colors, but it's about the culture, it's about the people, it's about the women, it's about the craft. So um, um, every collection I do is connected to a Sam. Every piece I make is connected to a Sam. Every time I talk about my work, so it's, it's, it's very strong. It's not just, you know, it's just not about the anecdote. It's a living memory and it's something that I hope will continue long after I'm gone. <laughs> With, uh, by my friend, I mean, yeah. It's certainly a living memory. Uh, so let's talk about your journey now. Uh, you know, it's easy for people in Delhi and Mumbai to say, oh, well, I was in Delhi, I was in Mumbai, I was pretty exposed. And from there on, I moved on, uh, you know, to a, a, a global, uh, say, a, a playground. And I performed yeah. well. Um, and, and we see time and again that it is, uh, these are people from tier one, tier two cities, like right. where you come from. And we usually make it uh, uh, to the top, to the global stage. What is it in people like you, I guess, like me too, that drives us uh, to perform so well at an international stage? Well, I think it's, uh, it's curiosity, you know. I mean, um, I always grew up in a family that had very strong women, right from my grandmother, who was a doctor. At that time, you know, my grandmother in Shillong was a doctor. 
my um, my aunts, my mom, they're really, really fiery women, uh, very independent, educated. Um, so that's how I grew up. So there was no question of not wanting to be successful, um, going to the best school. I mean, it was really um, the way I was brought up. I mean, all my my whole family has been very, very strong with uh, with their studies. I think we had something in our in our in our blood that sort of drove us to work hard in school in college. So and then I I don't know. I mean, I think it's just something that sort of grew within me. I used to read a lot. I was very exposed. I mean, I I used to. I remember that when I was a kid, I would take my radio and so, as soon as I came back from school, I would just, you know, sit in the garden, try to get BBC Voice of America, listen to the bot. I wrote a letter to Regan. I mean, I've always been really curious. I think curiosity is something that sort of opens up our world and we don't feel like we're stuck in a tiny city anyway. It, doesn't, it has nothing to do with where you are geographically. It, it depends on how much you want to learn, how much you want to see, how, how many questions you want to ask. And uh, uh, I grew up in a family like that. So I've always been that way. And then... Luckily enough, I was a hardworking student, so I made it to some pretty good schools and everything. So um, never really asked myself the question of, you know, how, how am I going to do this? or how I just knew what I wanted to do, and I just made sure I did it. There was no question of uh, obstacles or constraints. So uh, it's just, uh, you know, a very clear direction in life. And uh, just and I think in India, we're very lucky because we have to work so hard to get where we want to get. I mean, that's not, at least in my time, I think things have changed a lot now. So it's very clear. I mean, if you want to achieve what you set out to achieve, you just have to work there to, you know, to get there. So it, it was, very, I was very driven and very lucky to be in the family that I grew up in, I guess. Right. I guess we agree on, on one word you used right in the beginning when you started off, uh, saying that, you know, we are curious lot. And I, yeah. I still remember I used to take some classes uh, with uh, some of the one school in Sikkim uh, on journalism, it was a very short course on journalism. Uh, it was more about making them ready, making them being able to speak in front of people. And we had an entire uh, little, uh, you know, subject on being curious. Uh, and I was like, you know, how, uh, you know, being curious uh, is very important, not necessarily poking your nose in other people's business, oh, no, but, yeah, generally, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but generally being curious. It's such a powerful thing and you discover so many things and you know it just makes you a better and a stronger person i i, I feel like that so that's where we connect uh, tell us when did you decide uh, that uh, you would want to spend the rest of your life uh, doing something far far away from from assam uh, in a in a uh, in a city like paris okay so i that was that was quite a gradual process so i moved so i went to um, ahmedabad to study and then I got a job uh, in, a, in a great company in Hong Kong. At the time, there were very few women that went to IM, IM Ahmedabad. There were very few Indians who left India. I think in my batch, we were probably the first couple of kids to have gotten jobs overseas. This was in 1997. So I'm very old. <laughs> but yeah, so that was, you know, it was a big, it was a big boost to my ego to say, okay, I'm a woman. I've got this great job. So I didn't really think about, think about it. I just left. So I went to Hong Kong and I ended up... Uh, uh, working with a very big American company. It was an engineering company. I was doing marketing for them. And then uh, completely by chance. So I was very interested in music. I've always been a musician, singing, playing and all that. And uh, this friend of mine who had come to IM on an exchange program sent me a message one day. And, I, and he said, you know, I have a friend who's moving to Hong Kong for an internship. He plays the piano. You guys are going to get along. You should hang out because he doesn't know many people. So we hung out. And, you know, the, the rest is history. So uh, he's French. And then uh, a couple of months later, he was coming back because he had finished his internship. And I figured out a way to join him. And then uh, that was the story. So I came to Paris without really anything. <laughs> I didn't speak the language. But because I had my fabulous degree behind me, I went to ESSEC and I said, look, um, would you accept me for, for a course for one year? And because I'd been to IAM, they said, OK, so they gave me a scholarship. I used that here to, of course, make connections here with the professional world and to learn French. And then I ended up with a job at L'Oreal. So that was the first step. And the second step was that I spent a couple of years with L'Oreal and I was I had a really good job. Um, but I just I was missing India a lot, first of all, because I was very attracted to the Northeast, very, very particularly. And um, I realized very early on in my career that I couldn't really have a boss. It was quite it was quite evident. 
So I decided very early on again that I was going to quit and start on my own. I think had I waited for a longer time, things would have been more complicated and I would have probably stuck to a corporate career. But I decided to take the jump, take the risk. I had just had my first child at the time. And uh, yeah, so I, in the beginning, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I did a couple of consulting assignments for people related to cosmetics, uh, helping them do some assignments in India, uh, doing some market research, some studies for them in Bombay and Delhi. And then slowly, I made some connections in the creative uh, industry. And, uh, you know, I used to wear things and people in fashion would say, oh, that's really great. Where did you get that? And I would say, no, I just picked it up in some village and I got something done. And slowly, I started exploring the opportunity of actually using that creative eye to develop a business model. And that's how it started. Wow. Um, for the young people who are listening in, uh, you know that, you know, people of the Northeast are extremely stylish. Uh, uh, they know how to carry themselves. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, MBA in luxury brand management right. uh, sounds really interesting. Uh, and, and I know that there is a lot of talent. Uh, there could be a lot of people wanting to do this. Uh, what does it teach you? And, and, you know, what are the prospects of it? So, well, um, the MBA in luxury brand management actually is very relevant in a country like France because this is where the luxury industry sort of born and has, you know, this biggest hub of luxury in the world. The French companies, whether you look at Louis Vuitton, whether you look at Pantone, these are companies that are known worldwide with the best brands. So it basically teaches you about how these companies uh, look at their own creative process, how they look at their marketing process, how they look at the manufacturing process. And it's a big, it's, it's very interesting because, um, you know, a luxury brand today, things are different because luxury companies are hiring people from Apple, they're hiring people from the telecom companies. But earlier, the luxury market was actually a little bit different from, I would say, the FMCG market. So, um, you know, you have to be a little bit more aware of how to function in this environment. And I would say today that it's luxury brand management is interesting, but it's better to do a proper FMCG kind of corporate job, I think, before entering the luxury market, because things are changing so fast, whether it's digital marketing, whether it's loyalty management, CRM. These, I think these concept are, concepts are stronger in bigger FMCG companies. And if you learn and you get trained in these kind of corporates, life becomes easier when you go to a more specialty oriented brand, which, uh, which is a luxury brand. So, wow. Okay. So you worked at uh, L'Oreal, you said, for about, what, four years? And yeah. then you uh, decided to quit and start your own label, Jamini. But then uh, I after worked for another company for two years, also in cosmetics, and then I quit, yeah. Okay. So so what, what motivated you to start your own venture? Well, the first thing was personality-driven. Personality as I mentioned, I knew that I couldn't have a boss, so I had to be my own boss. <laughs> that was very clear. And the second thing was, uh, you know, this art and craft of India. I've always thought that we have, you know, fabulous artisans. We've got this amazing know-how, especially in the Northeast, because the rest of India, as you're probably aware, is quite well developed in, in the craft business. You have the Dastakar, you have the Emporium, and, and everything you get is quite, quite beautiful and high-end and quality is great. But I always felt that the Northeast was you know not connected uh, well enough this was again many years ago things have evolved since then and I, I i was so in love with our textiles you know i i remember my people in the village all the women wearing these beautifully woven things the the airy uh, the airy uh, sadars the meklas and the the work on it i mean the designs are of course very traditional at that time they were even more traditional the colors of course but the work the the, the know-how i was just fascinated and i said how come this this know-how is ignored in the Western market. We, we don't know about it. And even if we did, we didn't talk about it. We were not proud, or proud of having this uh, heritage. And that was really my driving force. And I said, we've got this amazing wealth and I want to bring it here. I want to make people feel that we are at the front end and not the back end because Indians were always the back end of manufacturing. You know, we would always manufacture for big labels, but nobody nobody would know it's made by Indians, by Indian artisans. So I wanted to bring us on, on the for forefront and not be at the back end. So that was really my motivation. So, uh, so, so, how did it start when you were, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, formulating your plans for Germany? Did you come back here? I uh, take a lot of stuff there. Yeah, how yeah. Did yeah. You, so, um, I, every time I traveled to India, again, I was very curious. So I, I would always, always, always visit, um, you know, these craft places, try and find out which kind of 
craft is coming from which region, um, how delicate it is, how we can produce. I've always been very attracted to this sector. I don't know why it's always been with me, I think because of the women that, that were in my life when I was earlier, when I was younger. And uh, so I had, you know, I had a pretty good uh, sense of what could be done and what was beautiful and what would work. And so I just put together for a couple of years before I started my own brand, I would put together an idea box. So I would just collect uh, techniques that I was interested in. I would sort of um, get in touch with a couple of people that I knew and say, okay, can you rework this for me? Because I think it would look nicer like this. So every two seasons, I would come with an idea box and I would visit some of the really big French brands and say, say to them, look, uh, this is what I think I can do for you. Would you be interested in launching a collection based on this know-how? And they would design a collection. I've worked for, with brands like Dior, for example. They would design a collection and I would get it manufactured using uh, my contacts and the things that I had developed. So for the first couple of years, I actually worked for other brands. So I was like a white label manufacturer, but that gave me a lot of experience. And a few years later, my friends just said, you know, this is rubbish. What you're doing is really beautiful. I think you just quit working for other people and start your own. And that's when I decided that I would stop working for other people and launch my own brand. So when you launched uh, Jamini, how was the initial response? What did uh, people like uh, about the brand? They just fell in love. <laughs> it was amazing. I was sitting, so in the beginning, I didn't even have a store. I was just, I just had the space and I was sitting and working one day and this like lady came in running and I had a couple of pieces on the window just, just for my own reference. And she said, and I was not ready to launch yet. Those were just like samples that I had been working on. She said, what is that? What is that? I said, it's it's just a cushion. She said, can I take a picture? And I said, yes, but who are you? She said, I'm the top journalist for Elle magazine and I want to put this in the magazine. So then I said, oh my God. So I had to go back to India two weeks later and start my production. I was not yet ready to, to launch the brand, but it went, my the pillow went on Elle magazine and I said, we can't have it in the magazine and not have a pillow to sell. So I, I rushed back to India, literally, I think the week after, and I went and saw this uh, this person that I was working with, and I said, "Please, please, please help me. You better take out two hundred pieces for me in the next couple of weeks." That's how we started. <laughs> yeah, that, that was really, really. So it was really, you know, it was amazing. I I was just working. I had a couple of things there. Somebody saw it, said, "Okay, let's put it in the magazine." And I said, "Okay, now we have to launch. We have to launch. I mean, I have to I have to make my brand. It can't be just, you know." wondering about what I'm going to do and testing out new things and stuff. So that's how I launched. So I've been very lucky because I'm sure you're going to ask me these questions, but um, the positioning that I took for Jamini, which was something that I really believed on, which was based on the human uh, face of the, you know, of, of, of the business and the craft and the handwork and the made by hand, this whole thing, it was, it was really something new at that time. Today, of course, everyone talks about it. You want to talk about ethical business, sustainability has become, you know, the new marketing uh, hype words, I would say. Anybody who wants to be anybody has to be in that bracket. Whereas when I started my company, I was already there because that's what I believed in right from the beginning. As I mentioned, it was the women and what they wore and how they made it. That has been my driving force all along. So it was there from the beginning. And, and because I communicated it, because I felt so you know, personally strongly about these things, that people just accepted that and, and, and loved it from the beginning. So I've been very lucky that way. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean they do. I think, uh, yeah. So whenever people are trying to sell stuff these days, it's all about uh, sustainability. It's all about uh, how it's a social enterprise. It's also about telling a story that that works. Uh, so initially, what you are telling me, again, for the benefit of our viewers, is that with a product, you carry a story. So every product you carry has a story behind it. But how is it reflected in your store or how is it reflected on your website? So, well, first of all, if you look at my website, you see that every product, if you look at the detail of any product, you'll see that we mention the artisan. We know, we, we say which part of the country it comes from, who made it. Um, I have a lot of blog articles on the, on the technique of manufacturing or whether it's printing or whether it's weaving. Um, I actually, when I, when I travel to India, I take a lot of videos. I show them how the piece is made, where the raw material is coming from. So it's all, you know, it's really, it's not even a story. It's really about how the brand functions, how it has evolved, how it lives and breathes. So it's very real. So it's not just a marketing package. A lot of people actually try and make a marketing package from, from these kind of elements. But uh, mine has been a, a real true uh, living with the experience kind of story right from the beginning, the day Instagram started, 
you know, I've always been talking about the person who's making it, the block maker who's carving the wood. How the wood? Where does it come from? How is it carved? What kind of um, what kind of um, um, you know technique he's using to print it? How the yarn is dyed? Where it's coming from? Where how it's been woven? So it's I, I love that and I've always been talking about it and putting it right at the forefront of, of the brand and people, as you said, love stories, they love uh, travel. So when I tell them these stories, they travel with me, but I show them where these people live, what they eat, what they drink, how they make their tea. And it's just like, you know, it's a whole different experience altogether. So it's like, uh, not like buying a product. Uh, no. Buying a very wholesome experience. experience. Uh, you know, and every time you wear it, you watch it, you know, you have it somewhere. You know that uh, the place is comfortable. I, I, it, <laughs> is it a conversation starter at home? Your product, guys. My at home? What do you mean? Sorry, I didn't understand your question. Come again. I said, when your friends say your close friends take your yeah. products, or somebody takes a, a particular product to their house, you know, uh, because yeah. every product comes with a story, with a history, right. you know. Uh, I mean, in a, in a way, it is a conversation starter. It is not yes, a question. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's difficult because the, the 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 flip side to this whole adventure is that it's really become part of my life. So at some point between my friends, I really have to make a you know make a very strong decision to separate my work from my personal life because this whole thing is sort of envelops everything, whether it's my relationship with my family, with my friends, with my children. So uh, it's it's com that way is very complicated because I'm so connected to, to my work and to the people I work with. So yeah, it is. it could be a conversation starter, but actually I try and make a very conscious effort <laughs> to not have it as a conversation starter around my own personal life, you know, because it's, it's, a, it's a very strong part of my universe. So, but yeah, I mean, every product, when people come to my, when people come to the store, I'm in the store quite often because I like the contact. They, they tell me, oh, we, we saw where you went. We saw the food you were eating, that building you visited. So yeah, it's all connected to the story of the brand. But for a passionate person like you, even for a journalist like me, it's, it's, it's very difficult. It's a, it's a very thin line, uh, you know, uh, between, between work, uh, because you're so passionate about it, because wherever yeah. you go, People are going to ask you. People are going to talk about it, and you, out of because you know, it's just it's, it's just you. Uh, right. You you do start. How do you how how can you separate? I mean, I, I find it very difficult. Um, well, you know, I I really make a conscious effort. So how do I separate? I um, I don't always succeed. <laughs> I try. Um, I have to keep a very calm mind. So I I do a lot of physical exercise to just you know bring my mind to, to, to focus on things and to tell myself right now I have to cut from my work it needs a lot of focus it's not easy because it takes it's very taxing you know that uh, it's very it's very difficult to control your mind and I think that's something that one has to work on all the time and I think that's the only way to separate uh, you know at, at one, when you know you're going out of hand you say okay I'm getting too involved now cut it uh, close that window, open up another window. So I think it's about controlling your mind. And for me, that comes through exercise. And a lot of people do yoga, a lot of people do other things. I, I run, I just I just forget about everything. And, and that's, that's how I control my mind, yeah. Meditation also, Usha, meditation. Yeah. <laughs> it is a meditation, it is. Yeah, different people have to do meditation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, tell us about uh, your experience, uh, the challenges and the milestones uh, that came along uh, when once you decided, you know, that, that you're not going to supply to other people, that you're going to drive this passion yourself and that you're going to form a brand and drive it. So um, in terms of, I will, again, I have to look at the good side and the bad side. The good side was, first of all, when I worked for other people, I got a lot of experience. So I sort of felt more confident about myself because textile is something I didn't know at all. You know, I had never studied, I never knew how to look at a garment, I never knew how to judge whether stitching was okay, dyeing was okay, all these things I, I never knew. So uh, working for other brands was a good, very good experience because that's how I learned on the job. The difficult part of it was, um, first of all, convincing people that made in India is good because no one talked about it. You know, it's always, again, I said Indians were suppliers, but they were, they were ne never really at the forefront. So you had to really say that, 
you know, we're really good and uh, look at what we can do. So that's that's a new discourse that I had to start. So that was not very easy. Secondly, um, I think the other thing, being a woman, I know this is very cliche, but it's not really easy because, you know, you have to look out, look into lots of aspects of your life, your ch children, your social life. I got married and divorced, so that was something I had to take into account too. I had no family here. I had two little kids, no mom, no dad, no aunt, no cousin, no salary from my husband, setting up my own company. So that was mentally very challenging. And the third thing I think was also um, a slight hint of racism. Uh, you know, again, uh, we're in a country where it's the it's the hub of luxury, beautiful brands, the French lifestyle. People are very proud of their origins, of their culture. So to convince them that we are good enough, uh, that our products are perfect, uh, the quality is amazing, that we are fashionable. So that, that you know, you have to juggle you have to juggle a fine line between saying uh, we are Indian and at the same time we're as good as you without hurting their sensibilities. So these were the kind of sort of challenges that I had to face. But I must say that I really, really love this country and I'm very lucky to have a lot of friends and a lot of support. So the, all the challenges that came along, I mean, I just took them in my stride because any business you start, anywhere you are an entrepreneur is full of challenges. You know, so it's just you have to take it in your stride and you have to be prepared for it. So, so, so uh, could we say that the tipping point, uh, 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 you know, for Jamini was that uh, picture on L L magazine, or has there been more? Oh, there have been lots more. <laughs> uh, there have been lots more. So, um, yeah, it's it's been a you know it's been a long it's been a really nice it's been a really nice journey. So the tipping point was that sort of pushed me into production, I would say. But the idea has always been there. And uh, it's always been about, you know, it's for me, it's really a story about women and culture and pride in our in our heritage. And so this was all it, it was all there. And um, I just have to you know find the right moment to say, OK, let's go and do it and, and take the courage and stand on my feet and say, OK, we can do it. I can do this by myself. So, yeah. And without without having, you know, a fund manager behind me or a private equity fund behind me or or. Uh, or, or you know, you know it's all those all those kinds of questions have to be juggled as to where the funds coming from, how am I going to structure the company? Am I going to take money from someone? Am I going to put all my savings into this? Am I going to just uh, just you know have a small share and give ninety percent to someone else and have lots of money? So the, the, a lot of thinking went into it, and uh, so it's, I wouldn't say there's a tipping point. It was all very gradual and. Uh, you know, I was very intuitive. I really knew what I wanted. And I said, you know, I haven't left L'Oreal to end up doing something stupid. So let me just take my time, do it the way I want, and grow it how I want to. And, and it's been very, very, very fluid like that. But with all the pitfalls of being an entrepreneur, of course. And the double MBA has helped? <laughs> Must have. I don't know. Uh, an <laughs> MBA definitely helps. It definitely helps because, you know, it, it teaches you how to um, understand the finance of a business. I think that's really important, number one. And number two, it put me in touch with lots of fabulous people. So I think uh, I, I value the contacts I made through my MBA more than the MBA itself. I have just amazing network of friends everywhere. And uh, for that, I'm like really, really grateful. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and how do you manage? Because you said you know you have uh, uh, two children. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure your job uh, requires you to travel a lot, uh, you know, back and forth uh, to yeah. India and I guess to other places. How do you manage? So my uh, my girls are quite grown up now; they're adolescents, so they're not like kids anymore. But even when they were, they would just stay with their dad. I mean, you know, we we were happy at the kids half time, and when I travel, he was always really cool about it, and I was very cool with leaving the kids and. They've grown up to be fabulously independent young girls, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, um, also a parent, and uh, if I'm not here, he just has to take care of them. So that's that, that's brilliant. That's just brilliant. Um, why the name uh, uh, Jamin for your brand? Okay, so that's a very interesting story. Um, so again, when you know, one of the memories that I had in my head when I was growing up was the monsoon in Assam, and we had a lot of. Um, uh, marshes with you know, lotus flower growing on them. So my the, the vision of waking up in the morning, having to wade through this my marsh in water, trying to get to school because it had rained so much, but there would be lotus uh, lotus flowers everywhere in the ponds. It was just so beautiful. And even though we had to supper, take our shoes off and wade through all this water to get to the bus stand. So these memories I had. And so for me, it was really clear that my brand logo would be uh, the, the lily flower, water lily flower, which is which you can see on my website. And Jamini is actually Jamuni. It's the purple color of the petal from the underside of the petal 
of uh, so it means that purple jamuni. So jamuni just came from that. Wow. Right. As you were yeah. as you were speaking, I could all, uh, almost visualize, you know, because uh, most of us have done that. I right. could almost visualize that uh, that entire uh, thing in our yeah. In the morning, it's, okay, it's all flooded. How do I, you know, how do I cross my little garden to get to the path which is going to take me? And so, but it was so beautiful, and I was just like. Wow, this is amazing! But everything would be wet and socks and shoes, and but it was just so so strong. Yeah. Um, so there is a popular question now. Um, I guess uh, which has popped up because it is a popular right. question. You've lived in Paris for twenty two years. Mm -hmm. Right. It's sad to say you are a Parisian now. So what is the Parisian lifestyle? I know where this question is coming from. What is it to be a Parisian? Uh, well. First of all, I really love my freedom. You know, nobody asked me where I'm going, what I'm wearing. This is a land of free people. I, that's the thing I appreciate the most about Paris. Um, what I love about this city is the, the architecture is so beautiful. I love the cafes. I mean, you know, every evening, there are just tons of people sitting outside, laughing, having a drink, sharing things, sharing jokes. It is beautiful. It's, it's really, it's life. You know, as you come in here, even on a, at 10 p.m. at night, 11 p.m. from at night, the lights will be on. People will be sitting outside laughing and joking. It really reminds me of India, actually. It's that, you know, the, the Adda <laughs> that we call in Bengal. Uh, so that's very Parisian. I love the food and drink here. I really, really love it. I love my wines. I just I carry them to India when I travel. I carry huge quantities of wine in my bag when I travel to India. Um, yeah, what's there not to love, you know? And being Parisian, I don't know, it's just uh, being very curious. Parisians are extremely curious. I think this is something that we don't appreciate enough when we are not taught it enough when we grow up. You know, they, they ask questions, um, learn, want to, want to see what's going on, on the other side. They're very curious. They, they love life. They enjoy beautiful things. And it's good to be like that. Right. Uh, another question. Um... Yeah. You are an inspiration for so many young entrepreneurs, but uh, who are you? Who are the people you are inspired by? I am inspired by strong women. I like women. I like their stories. I like the fact that they're, you know, honestly, I was thinking about this question when you asked, when, when, I, when, you, when, I, when I was wondering what you can ask me. It's not one person who inspires me. It's just whole attitude. When you go to Assam, you see these women, they look so graceful and they're so tiny. But they're so strong, the way they manage the house, the, the way they manage their weaving, when the kids are sleeping, when they go to school, how resilient they are. Um, when you go to these villages in Gujarat, when you see how they, you know, the nomadic tribes, they're walking around with their kids, they don't have enough to eat, but they're still doing the embroidery. They're still, you know, they're so proud of what they make. That's what inspires me. I really like that attitude. I like, I like seeing that, you know, in these strong women who have so many obstacles in their daily lives, who who are not educated, who don't have money, who are dependent, but they have that spirit, you know? And I'm like, every time I see that, I just, I just love it. And that's what, that's, that's something that I really, really, really get inspired by. Right. Um, now coming to the kind of work that you do, uh, purely, uh, because, uh, you know, there are few designers who uh, kind of uh, do the fusion uh, work, so to say, that you do. Uh, your right. designs have Indian accents and techniques, but at the same time, they are very European also. Uh, yeah. When we look at the tones and appearance, how do you uh, manage to uh, tread this uh, fine line? And uh, what are your uh, styling principles? So basically, I love color. I've always been, um, I, I honestly think that I should have gone to a design school and not to management school, but that's how it turned out. So I, I love color. I love color, color palettes and I love visiting the museums here, the whole design aspect here. I'm very attracted to proportions. I feel the proportions have a, you know, I mean, I could have been an architect in my other life or something. So um, I integrate or I've always been integrating the sense of proportion and color and palettes every, since I've been very little. So it's very natural. I, you know, I have that eye. I don't know how to say it. I'm not trained for that. But so I take the techniques that are so strong in India that we don't have anything to do with it because it's so strong already. There's no, you know, you don't really need to improve the technique in India. But I think what we really need to improve are aesthetics. And because I live here and I'm so influenced by the art scene here or the visual aspect of the city or even of the countryside, I carry that into my design. 
It also so, must be, you know, because of the young years spent around the beautiful forests of uh, of uh, Margarita. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, go on, Usha. No, 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 absolutely. I mean, the whole, the whole color palette, the, you know, the contrast, the leaves and the, you know, the, the ferns, the, the leaves, they are, there's, such, there's so much proportion going on there. It's so, like, everything is, when you go into Manas or Kaziranga and you see everything that is played out, I, it's just like a painter's palette, you know, when you see Monet's painting and you see where he painted, it was all in the countryside. And I'm very, uh, very connected to nature that way. So it has a big inspiration. Um, so when I see those things, they, they, they really create a photographic memory almost, you know, so yeah. Right. And uh, you mostly work with uh, small scale artisans, both in and outside India. Yeah. Uh, how have they been impacted by the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic? And, uh, you know, as uh, lockdowns are lifted, uh, how are things looking uh, uh, for them? Because you are in touch with them, I guess. Yeah. Uh, well, they have been very badly impacted because they are the last, you know, they're the final end of the supply chain, the small artisans, as you can imagine. They're not big factories. They don't have big orders to place. But um, once again, I mean, these people are so resilient. So everything is slow now. We have to depend on God's grace, I guess, more than, more than anything else. Uh, everything is slow and everything is uh, held up. But I'm very patient with these people because I know that it's very tough for them. Um, I trust them. I believe them. I know that things take probably thrice as long right now. So yeah, they, they, they're they having huge difficulties getting uh, the yarn from Bangalore up to Guwahati where I'm weaving. They're having huge difficulties in getting the dyeing done because everything is taking three times longer. But uh, but they're still there. You know, the, the looms are still up and uh, um, they're, they're still around. So I'll be with them as long as uh, I can. But yeah, yeah. of course, it, everything is three times as slow. Right. And, and how has it impacted your company personally and the industry overall? And uh, considering, you know, France has now lifted all the restrictions. Right. Uh, how are you and your company adapting to the new normal? Well, um, it has impacted the market quite a bit for two reasons. First of all, consumers' expectations are changing. I think this is a global phenomenon, right? People are going to be wanting a different kind of purchase experience, buying experience. They don't want to just buy from a high-speed brand anymore. Um, and that's the first thing. The second thing is a supply chain. So I think these are the two really, really big things that we're going to see. Uh, as far as the consumer expectations are concerned, again, um, as I mentioned earlier, I was on the right side of the consumer expectation right from the beginning of the story. So I've always been connected to the people, to the product, to the craft. So that has that is becoming more and more important in the purchase decision today. So we've been on the right side of that. As far as the supply chain is concerned, well, because my company was growing so fast until now, I've always been ahead in terms of placing orders and stuff because I've been predicting that increase. So I had a lot of leeway in terms of uh, stocks. A lot of the other companies actually couldn't get merchandise because uh, companies shut down very quickly in India. So there was no merchandise to be brought, whereas I had predicted a heavy rise. So I'd actually ordered a lot of stock. So I was very lucky in that way because we didn't really get caught in the lockdown. lockdown. But I think things are going to be really, really tough because so many people are going to lose their employment. So many stores are going to close. Uh, people, people's buying habits are going to change. So we've got to be very, very careful and observe what's going to happen over the next few months and years. It's not going to be, things are not going to come back to normal. I'm sure about that. Right. So we have and and, 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 and and interesting that Usha is talking about this uh, because uh, you know uh, she's talking from uh, her experience not just in Paris where she has a store uh, her products are distributed at all high end multi brand stores across the across the world in France Italy Japan Switzerland Germany U S um, how do you see uh, demand do you see an increased demand and acceptance for Indian crafts across the globe? And if so, uh, what does it uh, mean to you? And what are the trends that are emerging? Well, I see a, a global acceptance for crafts from everywhere, not just from India, uh, from South America, very, very important, from uh, countries like Colombia, Venezuela, Mexico, their crafts are becoming really relevant today because again, these are communities that have been ignored for very long and they make beautiful things. India, of course, also crafts from the Far East, like Thailand, Vietnam, uh, crafts from Africa, uh, you know, especially now Black Lives Matter, all the black artists are being exposed in a way that 
that is fabulous, which they've not been having for a long time. They've been, you know, hiding behind the limelight. So I think, yeah, craft from all kinds of uh, countries are going to be, even in France, I think people are going back to French craft, which had sort of given way to industrialized products. So people are actually going back to handmade, do it yourself. Everything is about the human, the human aspect. So I think it's going to be a long, uh, long, long term trend. Yeah. I don't know if you asked me a second question, but that was the first part of the question, I think. Um, are there any red flags when it comes to taking Indian crafts to the world? Are there any, sorry, what was what was that? Red flags, any problems you see? Yes, uh, yes. I think one has to be very, very careful about quality in India. So because a lot of times uh, I think that one has to be very open-minded about this. Um, um, you know, in India, we have this whole thing of jugar. We all know what that means. And uh, as far as work is concerned, uh, you have to be very aware that most of India believes in that concept and gets by on that concept, but it doesn't work overseas. So a concept of jogar, of getting the things done somehow or the other is not feasible. It has to be done properly. We have to take time. You have to go through the right channels, process things, take time to understand. This is something that I have a hard time um, you know, conferring with my with my Indian um, partners on because this whole thing of oh, it's it looks beautiful, so it's going to work. No, <laughs> you know, uh, it's going to work when when you understand how people need it to be, not because you think it's beautiful. So I think that's the red flag in the sense that yeah, I think Indian craft is going to be very popular, um, but one has to be very very careful about how that demand is going to be uh, met because we can't just put you know, products in because they th because somebody thinks they're beautiful. They really have to match quality standards. People are very particular about the kind of dyes we use. Um, so those kind of things have to be taken care of and that's going to take some time and training. And I guess when it comes to the Northeast, also consistency, uh, you know, being able to consistently deliver one, the quality and also the quantity that's uh, demanded. Because I, what, what I have seen uh, when I speak to people who are working uh, uh, with artisans in the Northeast is that uh, uh, some of our artisans are very, very moody. Right. They're moody. Or we have curfews. We have electricity failures. We have transport problems. So these are very important things. Absolutely. And until, you know, until one um, includes enough margin to take into account the, you know, the delays and, and variations, it's very difficult. It's not easy. So you're absolutely right. I think they're moody because, uh, you know, we've always been like that. Uh, the people in the Northeast have very big egos, very strong personalities, and we don't like being told what to do. And that's how just that's why we love people from the Northeast. So but we still have to understand that when you're working from somebody, the client for, for somebody, the client is the king. And if you want to keep long term relationships, we have to understand what the client wants. Not easy. <laughs> In one sentence, you kind of like, uh, you know, uh, uh, wove so many problems together. I guess right. we can overcome everything. Uh, uh, let's talk about the new age uh, consumers, millennial and Gen, Gen Z now. Uh, of course, we are old. Uh, they, are, they are very careful about uh, brands they purchase, I guess, at this point. And right. uh, they want to get brands which are sustainably sourced. In fact, uh, you know, some of them are even staying away from uh, big brands who are failing uh, to pay, compensate, uh, uh, take care of the rights of the workers in developing countries like uh, Bangladesh. Do you see a move towards a marketplace where we see big brands disappearing? And again, like you talked about how, uh, you know, uh, French craft is coming back. Uh, do we see local brands being appreciated more also in the context of uh, COVID-19? Absolutely. Well, I see two things happening. I see local brands being appreciated more because everybody wants to reduce their carbon footprint. So that's a huge thing. Um, everyone's like consume local, consume local, stop spending money on flying things from all over the world. And they're right. And I also see that big brands have to adapt to these new consumers. So it's not like big brands are going to disappear, but they're going to have to adapt. For example, I can tell you very clearly that uh, a lot of big brands that you and I both know, European brands, are going to source now, for example, 100% organic cotton for making their product. So it's not that they're going to just, you know, one day just shut shop, but they'll have to adapt more. They'll have to pay their workers better. They'll have to invest in the education of the women's children who are working for them in the factories in Bangladesh and have to do it because with social media, everyone knows what's going on. And I think I'm very, very proud of the younger generation because they're really going to succeed where we failed. You know, whether it's uh, in politics or whether it's in uh, 
manufacturing or whether it's society in general. I think they're very aware and I'm so proud to see what they're doing. Yeah, good for them. Right. Uh, we are kind of running out of time. One final question. What do you miss? This is my favorite question. What do you <laughs> miss about, about home? And uh, what food uh, do you miss most from home when you're there in Paris oh, or traveling amazing. around the world? The smelly bamboo shoot is what I miss. <laughs> um, well, I miss I, I miss the smells and the food, of course, the most. I miss my family, but my family, I can see them. So I miss them. I miss them less now than I did in the beginning when we didn't have, you know, Zoom and this, that and the other, because now we're in touch quite often. I really miss the food. So I've done something very interesting. I have a country home about 150 kilometers from Paris and we have a garden. I have a greenhouse and I actually have Assamese as vegetables. Actually, Assamese uh, hak. Uh, so I actually make Assamese food in Normandy, which is 150 kilometers from here, because I got the seeds from there. So I have uh, I have my bamboo shoot, my mustard oil, mustard seeds, then pretty much everything you want. Sikkimi's uh, chili. <laughs> it's all set up. So now with COVID, it's complicated because I'm traveling less, um, less uh, able to bring these things back. But yeah, I'm bringing them, introducing them to everyone in France. They love it. Wow. So next time I come over, I'll call you and you can tell me what all the you know, next lot of vegetable seed uh, yeah, that yeah. you want to be brought in. I will, I'll do that uh, for you. Sounds and, good. Uh, of course, we welcome you to Sikkim anytime you want to come and visit visit my state. Thank you, Usha, for joining us and uh, you know uh, giving us uh, time. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Good to be here. It was a pleasure speaking to you. And to our viewers, thank you so much uh, for watching. Uh, this was another inspirational story in our series. We'll continue it. Join me again, same time, next week. Thanks for watching.